Okay, welcome. Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Alan Budman. I am the Vice President of FJMC. We are proud to present this evening. I want to tell you a little bit about FJMC. FJMC offers you a unique and valuable opportunity to be part of something bigger than yourself while also allowing you to feel significant and accepted for being just as you are. I am honored tonight to introduce Richard Stone, the CEO of StoryWork International. Since 1990, Richard has assisted organizations in helping them to tell their story better. As CEO of StoryWork International, he has been pioneering new approaches to bringing the practical applications of storytelling into all facets of business, healthcare, education, and society. He's the co-creator of StoryCare and also created the Living Stones program for Novin Health, which facilitates patients telling their life stories to improve their health outcomes. Richard, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, so uh, I want to share with you some new ideas some new thinking about uh, what it means to be intelligent, <laughs> and what it means to be a, um, a dynamic uh, human being. And, uh, and in some ways, what I'm going to be sharing with you is as ancient as as humankind. And yet, uh, it's based on some uh, relatively new thinking that's coming out and a lot of research that's coming out, especially when we're doing uh, uh, FM, you know, fMRI research on the brain. And we're going to be looking at the power of story. So I'll, I'll share my screen with you. And, uh, and there we go. Can you all see that? You give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're, we're going to explore what I call story intelligence. And I'll kind of get you into that. And explain what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, just just a little about me. This is the uh, new book. It just today is the official launch day. So thank you for having me on the official launch of Story Intelligence. It's just, and uh, I'll tell you more, but there is uh, today and tomorrow, there's, if you, if you are a Kindle reader, it's 99 cents uh, if you want to get it, but it's also out in paperback. The, the hardback will actually be out in two weeks. It's, it got delayed. And then uh, it's also out in Audible. So it'll be available. It, that's also available at Amazon. I'll put the link in at the end of the evening. Uh, but I've been doing work with Story for, for many years. Uh, I got to know some of you here when I came and performed the Magad at the New England uh, retreat. Uh, I guess it's two years ago, something like that. I don't know. Gosh, it, it's hard to believe. Uh, but I've been writing about Story. I've created games on Story and products for healthcare and Story. Um, so I know a little bit about story, just a little bit more than maybe, you know, they, they say in the land of the blind, the one, the one eyed man is king. So, uh, so maybe I just know a little bit more, but um, so we've, we've identified that there are seven powers of story. And, uh, and what I mean by that is that there are seven dimensions to the way story works in our lives. And I'm going to talk about all the all seven tonight with you. Uh, the first is to transport. We'll get into each of these, but this is about the ability to take us to a different place in time. Stories have the capacity to really not only take us to a different place in time, but also uh, take us into someone else's shoes, literally and figuratively. We can go live inside of someone else's world uh, to communicate. Um, this is all about how do, how do we communicate really effectively that we can actually persuade people. We can actually um, lead people in a way that they'll want to follow. Uh, uh, the third is to uh, is to enable learning, and and you you may notice I didn't say teach. Um, I worked for many years with a woman out of, who came out of the Oneida Native American tradition. Uh, in their language, they didn't have a word for teach. Uh, the closest uh, translation would be enabler of learning. So um, I don't think you can actually teach anybody anything, uh, but what you can do is enable learning, and it turns out. Uh, that story is um, ideally suited for that for that goal. Uh, the fourth is to create meaning, and, and and this is about how do we make sense of our life experiences. And story is is profoundly suited to that, and we use stories, and we'll talk a little more about that. But it is it is it is the um, the doorway to uh, developing a, a more coherent, meaningful life. Uh, the, uh, the, the fifth one is to transform. And so how, how do we take intractable and sometimes difficult things 
and create new life trajectories through the use of story. Um, and we'll see, we don't have, you know, <laughs> I, I could spend a whole evening on each one of these, but you know, uh, the, the sixth is to unite. We know that stories can powerfully disconnect us. And, uh, but the question is, can we use story to actually weave us back together and, and, and bring people closer? And the last is, uh, is to envision possibilities. And we often think about story as something retrospective, you know, what happened in the past, telling about something that occurred previously. But it turns out the areas of the brain that we use um, to store memories are also the, the same areas of the brain that we use to envision possibilities. And so uh, it turns out the better we are at, um, at creating a story, uh, a robust story about the future, the more likely we can actually realize it. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into each of these uh, with, with a little more depth uh, over the next few minutes that we have together. So the first is the power to transport. You know, if I said to you, you know, once upon a time, the cow jumped over the moon, um, <clears throat> none of you would, would object and say, wait a second, and maybe, maybe Steve Broder would, but uh, he, of, of all of you, but none of you, none of you would say, hey, wait a second, I've never even seen a cow jump over a fence, much less, you know, the moon, and, and what about the atmosphere up there? How are they gonna breathe? You wouldn't do any of that. You would give me your metaphorical hand and say, well, what, what happened that next? What did he do after he jumped over the moon? And so um, there is this concept of what we call the willing suspension of disbelief. And when we enter into a story, we suspend our disbelief. We allow the conditions within the story to define the experience and we don't question them. We just enter in, uh, in a sense, naively and, uh, and wholeheartedly and whole, with our whole mind and body. So stories do that in, in an incredible way. And I think this is really the foundational power of story is that it can do that with us. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our brain on story and maybe why that works. Um, there's a, a researcher, Uri Hassan, who's at, at Princeton. And he's been sticking people in M uh, MRI machines. I, you know, I don't know why. <laughs> it's not exactly the, a conducive environment for, for sitting and listening to stories. But, you know, if we could put all of you in an MRI machine right now and, and see what was going on in your brains, it, it would be probably frightening, partly. But, but we find that, that you're all, your brain waves all would look differently. But each of you would have a unique signature, you know, because you're, you know, various things are going on. They would, it, would be, it would be very uh, asynchronous. As soon as I start telling a story, you know, if I said, now, once upon a time, there was a cow who jumped over the moon. It, something interesting happens. Everybody's brains in train. Suddenly, you begin, everybody begins uh, um, displaying the same neural patterns. And the incredible thing about it is, is that your brains and my brain also in train my brain begins to look very much like your brain that's pretty powerful stuff and in fact that that's incredible stuff so you, we it allows us to try to connect with others in a very profound way um so if you were to imagine right now if i said to you um i want you to think back on an earlier time in your life when something happened with fire or maybe an earlier time when something happened with water. Let's just pause for a second and see if you can um, remember that experience. And, and what you're gonna find is you're gonna remember that experience mostly in pictures, not in words. There may have other senses involved. And so I want you to just take a moment right now and imagine you're making a movie of that experience from the beginning to the end. So just, just do that for a moment. Okay, so um, it, it, was there, was everyone able to remember something experience? Okay, so so uh, maybe if we could uh, un unmute people. Maybe I just like to get Martin. You were nodding your head, so I'm going to pick on you because I can. See, I don't can't see everybody. Could you just briefly tell us what you recalled? Could you un could you unmute Martin? Hold on one second. Okay, hold on. Hold on. You're still muted, Martin. Hold on. He's trying to unmute you. 
There you go. Am I on? Yeah, you're on. So could okay. you just briefly describe to us what you recalled? My first experience with fire? Yeah, what, what you recall when I just, we just, I asked you to okay. remember something. Um, I was a Boy Scout and I had to build my own fire on an overnight trip. And mm -hmm. I remember it very well uh, because I had to cook a meal in it and uh, the meal didn't come out so well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and how many years ago was that, Martin? Oh, that's got to be um, 50, uh, six, six. Okay. It, so, it, was a, it was a few decades ago, for sure. Many right? decades ago. Many yes. decades ago. Okay. And I imagine, and you, I imagine uh, where, where were you when you were building this fire? Can you remember, you, were you in the in woods? A, in a state park outside of Lowell in Bill Rickham, Massachusetts. Okay. I also managed to shame my mother because um, I put in a potato and it uh, came out and I gave it to the council, so it was hard as a rock. And I said, that's how my mother makes them. <laughs> the Jewish community in Lowell is very small. I got home the next day and my mother was screaming at me in the door. Why did you tell Frank Wachowski I make hard to take? So <laughs> and she never forgave you for-, for She never, for, exactly, she never gave, forgave for me. For maligning, maligning her cooking. Uh, you school. bet. <laughs> you, thank, thank you for sharing. Okay, You're so that, this is good. So. Um, so, so uh, let me let me show you something here, just to kind of uh, give us a little. So, I, I have this little diagram. I always tell people I have to use something, do something scientific, because Steve's on the on the line. He's a psychologist, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you have to. Something. But, um, you know, I said when we recall an experience, you know, we see these pictures in our, our mind. Did everyone, you know, see see visual? And, and maybe you had other senses. You might have smelled the fire. You might have. You know, you, you may have had taste or hearing, maybe, you know, in your experience. Um, and and I would imagine, Martin, all the sensations and feelings you just had, uh, you had in the original experience, it all came flooding back. It, it almost felt like you were there, right, 55 years ago. And, yeah, so one of the things that stories do is that they, they there's a notion that the body doesn't know the difference between a real event and an imagined one. And so when we are recalling an experience, an early experience, we're reimagining it. And our minds, our minds are not like uh, computers. It's a nice metaphor sometimes, but it's not like pulling up a Word doc, okay? Every time you pull up the Word doc, it's the same doc every time, right? But every time you pull up a story, uh, you know, it's a little different. It depends upon the, where you are and it depends upon who you're talking to. And, and whether you, you you stretch it out, and sometimes the fish gets bigger. That if you were catching a fish, you know, for over years it gets bigger and bigger, or whatever. And uh, so, story is a creative process. Now, the problem the problem that we have is that if Martin wants to transfer that experience to us, uh, we don't yet. We'll probably have it soon. The the ear modem, where he could stick a modem in his ear, and I could stick one in my ear, and he could just send me the experience. Can't do that. So what does he have to do? He has to translate his memory, those visual uh, items into pictures, into words. So in this, in this example, this uh, young, this person's remembering a time when the barn burned down. So, you know, when I was a young man, I remember our barn caught fire. Okay. And he goes on and on and on and on. Now, as each of you were listening to Martin share his experience, did you see it as pictures in your mind? Could you imagine him at the fire you know, making his, building his fire and pulling the potato out of the fire. And, um, and so, you know, what we do is we recreate the experiences we're listening. We translate the words back into pictures and back into sensory data. And that's the way our minds are wired. And, uh, and, and you might have, I, I know I felt like I was almost right there at the fire with you, building the fire there in the state park. And so stories have the ability to transport us back in time and, and allow me to be transported into your experience. Now you see our friend here, she's, she's listening to the story. One, one she doesn't see it quite like the, the person telling it. So we listen creatively. We don't, we, you, know, we, you know, when you're telling the story, we recreate the story in our own experience. Now, if I was telling you about a barn burning down and where you lived, all the barns were bare wood you would construct a story in which the, the, the barn was bare wood unless I said the red barn burned down. So what we do is we draw from our own experiences to recreate and reconnect. And 
And you see, she's also reminded, I don't know if any of you were, were any of you reminded of anything as you were listening to Martin share? You know, a couple of you are shaking your head. So, so what happens is stories act like fuses in our imagination. They connect us to other things that we know that are related. So it's a powerful process. And, you know, and I, you know, it's, it's the only process that I know that can do all of that. Now, let me, let me share a couple of things with you here. So it turns out that, um, oops, uh, that, that, that all the senses are often triggered in, in, the, in, a, in the listening to a story. So uh, touch is often, and language is obviously there, but uh, visual cortex is engaged. Olfactory is often engaged. Auditory is engaged. Uh, there is pro language processing, but motor cortex is engaged. In fact, they, found, they find is that if you're listening to a story about someone running, the same neuron, the same neural areas that are associated with running are actually actually stimulated. So if you're in the movie theater and you're watching somebody running fast because somebody's chasing them, you know you're, you're you're on the edge of your seat. In your brain, that those same neural neural neurons are getting getting engaged. <laughs> now, it turns out, okay. Whoops, went to, didn't mean to do that again. Let's try if we can get through that. If if you were listening to a lecture, didactic information. It only activates two parts of your brain that deal with language co uh, comprehension and processing. You know, so for people like like Steve Roeder or others of you who are, have been teachers, you know, when you give a lecture, um, you, you're not engaging the whole brain. And what happens is that we tend to go off, we tend to wander off, in a sense, we're not as engaged. Uh, there's another important concept that a guy named Donald Hebb came up with this. And it's an important idea is that neurons that fire together wire together. So a story about yourself or about the world, if we tell it often enough and it doesn't take too many times to tell it, it gets wired in. And so we, we develop a particular way of seeing that gets, gets wired into our brains. And that's why it's very hard to unwire it. You know, and, and those of you who are therapists, you understand when people come in, they're bringing their story in. And, and, and it's, you know, that story, it, uh, it, there's, a, there's a whole field of narrative therapy. And in their point of view is it, it's not the wounding that actually creates distress for us. It's the story we tell about it and continue to tell about it. So we can we continue to re-experience it over and over again by the story that we continue to tell ourselves. Um, now there's some real value in this. We develop all kinds of neural patterns, uh, patterning that allows us to kind of become unconscious to do a lot of things. You know, you're brushing your teeth tonight or whatever you're doing, you know, you can just do it automatically. You know, the, the brain's on automatic pilot. Um, so there's some real value in that. Uh, the disservice is, is, that, um, is that we can often get stuck in stories that are not very valuable for us. Uh, and, and it is difficult to shift them. Uh, so there is this supernormal pattern and narrative schema, and, and our brain is looking for this. And this is all the stuff of story. I'm just going to run through it quickly. But an introduction of setting the characters, an explanation of state of affairs, there's an event, response or goal by the protagonist, complicating action, an outcome and reaction to the outcome. Our brains are are oriented to look for information that comes this way. And when, we, when it does come this way, we become more engaged. So let's talk about the second power real quick, the power to communicate. And, you know, we've already talked about how the brains entrain. Um, so I thought I would give you uh, a, a great example. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, a great example of, of how we can change behavior uh, one mind and, and, and maybe one heart at a time. Oops, I'm having a hard time with PowerPoint tonight. I've got leaned on the thing here. So um, I want to tell you a story about a, um, a soap opera that ran in Peru probably 40 years ago now. It was called Simplemente Maria. Uh, the storyline was this, a young woman, beautiful young woman, 18 years old. She's a peasant. She's illiterate. She goes to work in the kitchen of an aristocrat's house. And the young man, the, uh, the son of the aristocrats, uh, is enamored by her and falls in love with her and promises to marry her and gets her pregnant. And he goes to his parents and announces that he's going to marry 
the maid who works in the in the kitchen uh and and of course they're not going to have anything to do with that <laughs> you know uh it's a, it, it's it, it's it's an iconic story and so she's driven out and has to make her way on the in the streets and is uh, at some point find gets a gets a sewing machine and she teaches herself how to use the machine and she begins to take in clothing for repair and at the same time in the story as the story goes she decides she wants to improve her life and she wants to learn to read and write so she goes to literacy classes and over the five years of the show uh, there's an arc in which she goes from being a peasant and ignorant and she begins uh, not just repairing clothes but designing her own clothes and by the fifth season her designs are being shown on the runways in paris and the next to last uh, uh, episode her literacy coach proposes to her and she says yes and word gets out they're going to be filming the wedding at a church in peru in lima five i think it's like fifty thousand people show up it's a huge number of people show up with presents it was it was like they didn't know what to do they had to rent a soccer stadium and they allowed people to like you know, march past and give her give them the presents i think they had to give, give them to charity or whatever um and and here's something that interesting happened with this show over 30,000 women went out and bought sewing machines and started their own businesses. And almost an equal number of women went out and, and en enrolled in literacy classes. So there's a, a producer in, in, uh, in Mexico City, a very successful uh, TV producer in, in, the, in the TV business, uh, Miguel Sabido, and he goes, what the hell happened here? He, he's mystified that a TV show could, could impact behavior and attitudes so powerfully. And he, he went, he literally deconstructed every episode of the show, like, you know, like moment by moment to understand what was going on with the characters and how it was written. And, and he developed a methodology called edutainment. And I'm on the board of an organization in New York called PCI Media that has been using this methodology for over 30 years uh, mostly in developing countries, but also they've done work here in the United States, and they take all kinds of issues from health and environment and social justice, and they go in and they teach people the methodology, and they uh, they get people to create their own basically soap Ed, operas on radio, on edutainment. radio. Edutainment. Edutainment. E D U tainment. Yeah, and. Uh, and if, so that you can use story to powerfully change behavior and attitudes if you know how to do it and you can uh, do it well. So that's just a great example. Uh, the third power of story is the power to enable learning. And uh, I'll just tell you a very brief story. Uh, I, uh, Paula Underwood, whom I worked with, in the Oneida tradition- Edutainment. Okay, somebody would, I guess, I guess we may need to, so you need to go ahead and, and mute yourself. We're good. I mean, I mean, oh, you did. Okay. Um, so uh, Paula Underwood, uh, in their tradition, the United tradition, they had a, a, uh, a tradition of what they call learning stories. And they would start with children very young, telling these stories. And they would do something that we would not do. You, you know, our, our tradition of fables is, is to tell, you know, what we often, uh, you were told, tell them what you're going to tell them, Tell them what you, you know, tell them, and then and then and then tell them what you told them. Okay, you, how many of you heard? You, yeah, some of you are shaking your head. Yeah, you've heard that. They would never do that. They would just tell the story, and they would ask a simple question: What might we learn from this story? Because they understood that that every each of us, whether you're if you're five years old, you're going to enter into the story with the mind of a five year old, and if you're ten, you're going to see it differently, and at fifteen, you'll see it differently, and it in your early 20s, by you're an adult, have you heard the story over and over again and you've reflected on the story, you suddenly will be, see it through, through a new set of eyes. And so they understood that the cutting edge, the edge of learning happens between the story and us and are reflecting on it. And so after that story, they would never say to a kid, here's what you should know about this story. They would, they would say, what might you learn from this story? And in the, in the case, there's a, there's a story about who speaks for wolf, and it's about a time when they had outgrown the place where they had lived, and they uh, decided to move to a new place. And one of the scouts who had been out looking came in late and discovered where they had decided to move. And he says, 
bad idea. There's a great community of wolves that lives there. You know, they're, I'm afraid that there won't be enough room for them and us. But the people, they didn't want to hear that. They, they decided it was the best place. And they had already sent an advance party to prepare the land. And so when they got there, it was like Shangri-La. I mean, it was everything they wanted. It was, you know, there was clear running waters, places for their, their long houses. There were fields for growing their, what they called their three sisters, beans, corn, and squash. And nobody saw a wolf watching in the distance. One day, a hunter came and he, he put the, his catch against the, the, uh, the wall of the longhouse to go in to get a container. And when he came back, he saw a wolf dragging it into the distance. So the people gathered to discuss this, this issue. And, and they said, well, you know, a little food for rent, it's not a bad idea. So they started leaving food around the edge of the village. Well, wolf became bolder and pretty soon wild wolves were walking among the longhouses and the women were up in arms. You can't have wild wolves with children, you know, and the, and the men agreed this was a bad thing and they made a mistake. And so they, they put scouts around the, around the perimeter of the village and they drove wolf off. Um, but then fall was coming and, and she who was in charge of winter stores came to the elders and said, you know, I'm afraid we're not going to have enough food to make it through a long, hard winter. And so they got together to discuss this and they saw that, um, that feeding wolf had been part of the problem. They were giving their food away <laughs> instead of storing it. They saw that having people have to, have to guard the village, they could be out gathering food, but now they're having to guard the village to keep wolf away. Uh, someone said, well, you know, we could kill off this wolf people. And someone said, yeah, but do we want to be the kind of people who would kill rather than move a little? And so from then on, they, 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 they realized that they had, they had not thought through their decision process properly. And they, they, they always would explore every possibility and every avenue and, every, and the energy associated with each. And finally, they would, they would confront the things that they did not know that they did not know. And someone would speak to that and say, tell me now, my brothers, tell me now, my sisters, who speaks for Wolf? And, and, and then at the end of the story, they say, what might we learn from this story? And, and then people get to kind of reflect on it. And of course, you bring your own experiences and your own points of view. And, and one of the things that they understood was that there's old wisdom and there's young wisdom. Paula tells a great story. They were standing by a trailer of it, you know, a semi-trailer. And she was maybe five years old. She's probably, you know, three and a half or four feet tall, you know, and her father was six feet tall. And they're standing there and he, and he can't see because he's so tall. He can't see what's on the other side of the trailer. But she's short enough. She can see everything. And so, you know, they, they, they embrace the wisdom of young, young eyes and realize that young eyes have a point of view as well. And, and those of us with older eyes, sometimes we get a little jaundiced in the way we see the world. So that's a quick piece on the power of an, to enable learning. Just one other piece. Uh, one of the things that I've done in my career, we took this concept and we created a product for healthcare. I don't know if you know this, but you know, hundreds of thousands of people die from preventable harm in healthcare every year. And it's usually a breakdown of teamwork and communication. You know, wrong drug, wrong, you know, just all kinds of things that happen that is really a result of, of a breakdown of teamwork and communication. We created a whole library of stories, audio stories. And the idea was for teams to get together, listen to the story. And of course, the iconic question, what can we learn from the story, would be the first one. And, and they would debrief the story, much like, a, you know, a squadron of guys that go out and fly off of a deck of a aircraft carrier when they come back in the first thing they do is they go in and they debrief it and they see what we can we learn from what what happened here what went well what didn't that doesn't happen in healthcare there's they don't people after somebody dies or something goes wrong people don't get together and say okay let's debrief what happened here they just move on to the next incident and so there is no learning so there, there's a, this irony in healthcare you have lots of experts but you don't have expert teams. People have learned how to be great doctors and great nurses, but they haven't learned how to be expert teams. They have not developed an expertise in how to work together as a team. So it's just interesting. Uh, this product is still being used. Fourth power is to create meaning. Uh, ikigai is actually uh, Japanese. It's, it's a, that, that which gives purpose or meaning to my life. 
and uh, so story is is really ideally suited for this. It's really ideally suited for this. So, um, so for example, this is something really important. There's a couple researchers that happen to be Jewish. <laughs> You're in Emory, uh, Robin Feibusch and Marshall Duke, and uh, they've been studying what they call intergenerational narratives for 30 years. And um, and what they found, uh, and it was a, a bit happenstance. In, in the whole process of this is what they found was is that children who know their family stories actually have higher resilience and self-esteem than children who don't and in fact they found that that was the best predictor of children having high resilience and self-esteem so sharing our stories not just the good times but also the difficult times can be invaluable for children because you know what happens is as a child we're born into a story that's already ongoing right you know we don't have a story uh, we're in we were born into a story and so we have to adopt and we absorb the stories that we're get, that we're hearing and so hearing stories about difficulty uh gives us a story about what it's what it's like to overcome difficulty for example so they've developed a little a little scale called the do you know scale uh it's nominally 20 questions you uh, you can down if you go to storyintelligence.com which is the the website for the book this is available for free. They've given me permission to uh, replicate it. Uh, it's not that there, but there are questions. Do you know some of the jobs that your parents had when they were young? It's not that these are, you know, I, 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 you know, ironclad, but they are, they are sort of, um, they give you a sense of whether you know much about your family. So it's a great little scale to use. So there are a few different kinds of reminiscence that are important. One is instrumental reminiscence. That's using stories from the past to empower us in the present. It, it turns out that telling stories, remembering times where we face difficulty actually can help us face difficulty better in the present. Um, let's see, here we go. So we've created this product, this product called Living Stories at Novant Health. And, uh, and essentially what we did is we trained volunteers to go in and interview patients. And they would ask them for two kinds of stories. Tell me about time, uh, your, your fond memories. So you just, re, you just learned that the body doesn't know the difference between a real event and an imagined one. So here you are in the hospital and you're obviously not feeling well because you had surgery or you're sick. So remembering fond memories can actually key your body to produce all kinds of biochemistry that's associated with feeling better. And then we would ask them to tell stories about times when they face challenges. So what do you need to, when you're facing a, a difficulty health-wise, is to remember that you have resilience and that you've gotten through things. And uh, there's a lot of research that undergirds this. So I think we have what I call uh, narrative assets, personal narrative assets. All of us have these and we have to mine them. Um, there are a couple other kinds of, of life narrative that are important, transmissive uh, reminiscence. So, uh, you're probably all familiar with an ethical will, which uh, really comes out of our tradition, um, which is passing on our values, and 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 we don't have to wait till we die to get to do that. We can do it while we're still alive, and we can share, and they can be very tailored to different people. But it, that's what I would call transmissive reminiscence. And then you have what uh, is called integrative reminiscence, which is if you think of your life as a book. And there's seven chapters or eight chapters, whatever number of chapters there are. Have you included every chapter? And we have a tendency to want to exclude the difficult experiences, the painful experiences. But if we find a way to work with those experiences, we can have a sense of wholeness. We can see even out, out of the difficulty, if that hadn't happened, then we wouldn't have been doing these things. That sometimes that is a good thing. There's a a wonderful concept that comes out of J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. He calls it a you catastrophe. And, and Steve, this has nothing to do with she. I know that's the first thing you thought of, Steve. Uh, uh, but it, the, the word EU the, is, comes from the Greek for good, a good catastrophe. And so, you know, when something difficult or bad happens, you know, we, we tend to catastrophize. Oh, my God, you know, this terrible thing happened. Uh, but a you catastrophe is something that can actually transform and become something good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the power to transform. Uh, we're, this is uh, real quickly, and I, I don't think I think what, I just want to be respectful of time. We said about 20, 30 minutes, so I'm just going to tell you briefly. 
we can use story to transform our relationship to the past. We often think the past is the past and that's the way it is. But the truth is that in every moment, there are 40 million uh, uh, sense items, data for us to, to attend to. We're very select, we can't take it all in. We can only process, I think about 400 a second, okay? So the things that, the memories we have about the past are very selective in the way we, what we attended to and what we disregarded. So there's a lot more to go on and you've ever gotten together with your siblings and talked about, you know, remembering times of the past and you go, oh, wait, wait a second, that's not the way it happened. We have a different story. And, you know, and now we got an argument, you know, dad never did that. You, you, I don't know where you were, were, but you must have had your head in the sand. No. Okay. Uh, so the other piece of that is that we're always interpreting. So, you know, if you have a father, let's say you had a father who was a very strict person. You know, one, person, one, one, one sibling could say, you know, dad never liked me. He was always on my case. And the other sibling didn't interpret that away at all. It kind of really actually appreciated the, the boundaries. So you can create two different stories about the same experience. Uh, so we have the ability to go back and transform the stories that we have in the past. And so I want to get to the last, uh, last one is the power to unite. And, and uh, there's an old saying that the, 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 uh, the shortest distance between two people is a story, their story. And I'm sure many of you or most of you have had this experience is that, you know, there's someone, maybe you didn't even like the person, but then you got to know what their story was. And it shifted the way you saw them profoundly. Suddenly, maybe you had compassion for them. And so we can often, you know, the guy that cuts you off, you know, you're driving on the road, you know, the mass turnpike or something, and somebody's speeding around through and cuts you off. And, you know, you, you know you're, 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 you're screaming all kinds of, you know, things at them and what a jerk. And, 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 and you think they're an idiot and, you know, and you have a story about them. But then you suddenly, what if you knew that maybe their wife had just uh, they had had an accident and he was rushing to the hospital because she was dying? Now suddenly you go, oh, you suddenly have a different story about the same event. Um, so when, when we know people's stories, um, that it really brings us closer to them. And, and unfortunately, you know, we, we're not taking time to listen and be curious about other people's stories right now. It's very easy for us to live inside of our bubble and, and, and have a story about the other, you know, whatever the, whoever the other is. Uh, I'll tell you just a real quick piece of work uh, uh, that a, a buddy of mine, um, Paul Costello, who's in DC, has been doing for a number of years. Uh, this is a picture of what was called Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland in Belfast in 1921. I think there was another bad incident in the city. There have been some bad incidents along the way with Northern Ireland, okay? Uh, the IRA attacked British soldiers and the Protestants uh, uh, counterattacked. And by the end of the day, over 100 people had died. I think over 1,000 were injured. Over Nearly 1,000 houses were, were badly damaged or destroyed. In the pubs today in Belfast, whether it's a Catholic pub or a Protestant pub, this story is told like it happened yesterday. It's still told, okay? And if you're a young person and you're spending time in the pub, uh, it's like your brain is pickling in that story, all right? And that remember neurons that fire together wire together. That story gets pretty firmly fixed in your brain. And uh, years ago, uh, someone was bringing uh, a Catholic and Protestant college students to Washington, and they brought in a good facilitator to kind of you know, and and they found it wasn't working very. In fact, it was going badly because <laughs> everybody they were having it's it's really it's like Jews and Palestinians. You know, if you get Jews and Palestinians in this, in the same room. You know, uh, you know, things that each takes to be act, you know, absolutely true are completely contradictory. You know, things that, that are that even historical things like the Balfour Declaration, each has an interpretation of that. You know, a different, each has a different story about that. And, and each of us has a story about the other. And, and, and it's usually we build it, each of them, it's, it's like the same story. It's just, just, just change the actor, vilifying each side. And he realized that she called him and said, you know, this is not working. We need to do something else. And so one of the things that Paul realized was that we could spend time trying to adjudicate the 1921 bloody 
massacre of, of that of his bloody Sunday. Uh, but he realized what was more important was not to talk about the story of the past, but ask people to figure out a, a, what kind of story they wanted to create in the future. And something powerfully shifted. And so now when he brings, he's been bringing actually Palestinian and Israelis to Washington. And he's been working with other groups that are in conflict. And, and one of the, his now his requirements is, is that when they apply to come to the program, they have to, they have to have a business plan for doing something that's going to change people's lives. It's going to do. And so when they come, it's all about creating a new story, creating a future story. And he, he tells the story. One day he announced they were going to take everyone to the Holocaust Center. You know, and, and, and the Palestinians said, why, why are we going to their place? You know, and he said, he said, he said, because there's something to be learned there. One. And he says, and he said, well, why don't we have a place? He said, well, they got together, raised the money for it. Why don't you get together and raise the money and create a museum for the muse for the Palestinian people? And he went, oh, OK, well, if you now there is a museum to the Palestinian people in Washington, D.C., right off of uh, uh, DuPont Circle. He went out and did it, you know, so uh, so they, but they're doing all kinds of projects uh, in both you know, Palestinian territories and in Israel. Uh, and some are actually connecting people together. So there, there are possibilities to create new stories, uh, but if we spend time trying to completely replay and, uh, and live in the old story, I don't think there's a lot of possibility in that one. The final one is the power to envision possibilities. And as I said earlier, I think that storytelling is more about prospective thinking than it is retrospective thinking. So, uh, you know, the mind is a, uh, it's the perfect simulation machine. There was there was a great uh, uh, there was a great piece that was done a study that was done a number of years ago and you've probably heard about this and in, in sports psychologists have you done anything with in, in that arena uh, they had uh, they took uh, some subjects and they divided them in half and they were all were they had all played basketball and they had uh, they had some of the subjects just sit and for 20 minutes a day imagining making 20 baskets all net just in their mind. And then they had another group actually practice shooting baskets. And they found that the group that spent time imagining it performed almost as well, almost as well. And uh, there have been more studies like this. They, they took a group of, of college students and they said to half the group, they said, we, what we want you to do is imagine getting an A in the class. Imagine at the end of the class, you get an A. And the other half, they said, we want you to imagine the process you would have to go through to get the A. And it turned out that the group that imagined the process of getting the A far outperformed the other group. So we can use stories to simulate the future and to create a different possibilities. So I think that I'll stop sharing and see uh, what questions you've got. And uh, let's see if I can drag you guys over there and I'll stop share. And why don't we open it up for discussion and questions? Bob? You know, we, it's just such, first of all, thank you. This is fabulous. I've been writing notes and um, looking forward to downloading your book. What a deal, 99 cents. Uh, We're having a little trouble hearing you, Bob. Can you lean a little so closer to the mic, please? Steve, uh, uh, let me, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, actually do this. Let me just change my. Okay, well, that's going on. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, Benny. Yeah, I wonder if they, if you're taking in Midrash, for instance, in the in Jewish tradition, which is a lot of stories, how, how well does the, their structure of stories and, and um, let's say, questions or narrative uh, match up with what you have found now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if we think of, of our tradition of Midrash, um, you know, Midrash gives you um, a doorway into the text, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, 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 you know, the rabbi struggled with lots of different, you know, my, my favorite one is, is the story of Adam, Adam and Eve, you know, and, 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 you know, I think in chapter one, I can't remember the verses, it's a God created man and woman. And then it gets in chapter two is the whole story of taking the rib and creating Eve. And, and the rabbi said, what, wait a second, what happened to the first woman? Now, you could say, well, these were just two different versions, but the rabbi said, no, what happened to the first woman? You know, and, and so they said, well, maybe there was a woman. 
you know, <laughs> and it was Lilith. And, and the story was that Lilith uh, uh, was a little taller than Adam, slightly taller. And, and Adam already had a little hubris, you know, and just had an attitude. And they're walking along. He didn't like looking the fact that she was a little taller. And so uh, first he made her walk in front of him, but he didn't like the fact that she was going first. So then he made her walk behind and and now he couldn't see what she was doing and he didn't like that either. So he made her stand in a hole and she said, you know, I've, I've had it with this crap. I'm out of here. And she leaves and he goes to God and goes, hey, you know, what, what that woman you gave me, she, she, she left me. I'm all alone. And God sends three angels to catch up. They catch up with her somewhere over the Red Sea and they're, they're beseeching her to come back. And she she curses man. She says, I will never come back. And I curse, I curse humankind. And, and they beg her and beg her. And then she finally says, she says, well, I, I, I'll lift the curse if, if above the child's bed are the names of you three angels. And so, you know, in Sephardic homes, you know, how did they explain sudden infant death syndrome? It was Lilith. And so they would always put right above the, the crib. So, so stories are powerful ways of both understanding the text, but also helping us understand life. So our, that, you know, the Midrashic, I love the Midrashic tradition. And, and you know, we have also, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the Hasidic tradition is filled with stories. And uh, some of you that saw the little performance piece I did at, in New England uh, uh, a couple of years ago uh, called the Magad, um, you know, the Magad was, uh, you know, as an itinerant preacher, but he was someone who told stories, you know, and, uh, and it was, it was all about stories from the Baal Shem Tov and they were teaching stories. They were stories that allowed us to understand complexity. So yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Benny. Thank you, Bob, back to you. So, uh, can you hear me now? I yeah. turned off my mic. So, um, First of all, thank you. This is fabulous, and uh, ninety-nine cents. What a deal on Amazon! So yeah, I just I just put the link in the chat, so you can. It's it's good through tomorrow. So if you yeah. want to, if you go get it. Uh, but my, my, you know, the, the timing of this is so perfect because we're going to all be telling stories around the table um, next weekend. Um, That's right. Passover, and so, but the question is, um, you know, the story we're telling is basically, I mean, if we do it by the book, so to speak, by the book. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of inspired now to think whether we should uh, have more of a conversation and sort of t tell the story and stop and say, what did you learn from that story? I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever done anything like that to have that kind of conversation, because you can say we were slaves in Egypt and we cried out and God saved us. And you know, but what, what if you did pause and say, what, well, I wonder what we can learn from this. How, how's this relevant to today? And it will lead to, I, I think, a richer experience of connecting that story, this ancient story, to the dilemmas we face right now. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with Drusha drama? Have you ever heard that concept of that idea before? No. So I can't remember the author, um, but he, he has a way of working with the text. And so, uh, and I've worked with this before, is you have everyone adopt a different character, okay? And, and and you have them speak as though they're their that character. So you could have you know something. Okay, okay, you three kids, you're going to be Pharaoh. Okay, okay, you're you're going to be Moses, and and uh, and and yeah, Aunt Tilly, you're going to play God. You know, and 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 they suddenly now you 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 act out the story, but they basically improvise and they're telling it as though they are that person. So that's another way of entering into the text in a very rich, powerful way that because um, it can get very rote, right? You know, we do it over and we do it the same way every year. And and most of the adults going, oh, you know, gosh, I don't know if I can take this anymore. And um, but you can bring it to life and, and make it much more profound. And, you know, every there's all these wonderful new Haggadahs that are coming out where people are doing reinterpretations and making them. There's a there's a uh, an environmental Haggadah that's uh, uh, Ellen Bernstein has come out with. I think we're going to do one night with that, uh, that, that, you know, looking at it through a whole different lens. So, you know, there's lots of ways to entering into the story. Yeah, yeah. Martin had a, Martin had something there. Yeah, Martin. As um, uh, you were at the uh, uh, the retreat uh, two years ago now, 
And um, there are many people here that are on the, the uh, organizing committee for the retreat, including myself. And when we went to pick a scholar, it, we wanted to make sure that the scholar had good background, but also was he entertaining? You know, did, did, could, he, could he tell a story? And I'm reminded uh, a couple of years ago for the guys that were there, we had an archeologist, a very interesting man, a, a rabbi and a professor, uh, Richard Freund. And he told the best stories, at least I thought so. I don't know if anybody else would agree with me. But uh, at the end, we'd say, so what do you talk about? And a lot of times, go, I have no idea, but he'd tell great stories. But I bet you remember the stories. But we remember the stories. So it was just interesting. And so, you know, when you said about edutainment or infotainment, that's always seems to be the underlying thing about our retreats, because we've had some incredibly boring, brilliant, but boring, pedantic professors, because they take their uh, lecture notes from whatever university or, or rabbinical school they teach at, and they decide that we're their students. And it, <laughs> so uh, work, I think right. some guys are, are smiling here. I think that we getting some residents from resonance from that. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's how well you can tell a story. Uh, yeah. Just a question though, do you, um, are you saying that you can't teach at all dog new tricks uh, because you were saying that we really don't learn? No, 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 not at all. No, okay, I'm sorry, no, I, I misunderstood. I think that you know our brains are very malleable. Uh, we're constantly, we have the capacity to be constantly learning. I, what I was saying about this whole notion of, of neurons that fire together, that wire together, you can see why we can get stuck. And so to create new neural pathways, we know if someone, uh, I have a dear friend, uh, Steve knew him, Ron Fell, who had a you know, terrible hemorrhagic stroke. He's no longer with us, um, but he came back. I mean, when I remember going to see him and he couldn't talk, he couldn't move part half his body and uh, he came 95% back. So he had, to, he had to lay down new neural pathways around all the you know, <clears throat> damaged brain tissue. Um, so uh, we can we can learn, and but we have to. I think we have to choose to learn. We have to become. There's there's some uh, well, a guy I'm working with, Dan Apple, who's very big in a thing called process education, and he says there's a difference between uh, growth and self growth. Uh, growth is because you know it happens in response. Something happens and it forces us to change. You know, we lose a job, uh, and we've got to remake our career and it's very painful and difficult but we get through it and we you know we we, we grow out of it uh, self growers are people who are constantly just choosing to throw themselves into new things and i think that's that's the key to vitality as we get older uh is to actually select actually consciously say okay i'm going to put myself in a position where i don't know bupkis about this and it's uncomfortable and I'm gonna go feel foolish, but I'm gonna learn something new. And so you can lay down all kinds of new neural pathways. Um, so, yeah. Okay, uh, I think Bruce, I'll, I'll talk, take Richard Gray first and then Bruce Tomar. No. Okay. Yeah, hi, it's uh, wonderful to see you again. Uh, I really am focused on your comment that uh, children who know uh, our family stories uh, create knowing families our family stories creates resilience and self-esteem um, my my parents were holocaust survivors and i really didn't know their family stories and i i, I can imagine or i'm sure that affected me and and my sense of of but of, of self-esteem and such and that's uh, fascinating i'm, I'm yeah. probably that's very common with so, so I, I'd encourage you, uh, I, I've started a new interview show called Explorations, and I'm, I'm interviewing people who are of expertise in story, and I've interviewed Robin Fibush and Marshall Duke, and if you go here, I'll put it in the chat, it's, uh, it's www.storyintelligence.com, and, uh, and if you go to Explorations, uh, there's an interview, there's an interview with them, it's actually, it's broken into like four parts. And they have been doing work with Holo with children of Holocaust survivors around this issue, and, and it's more complicated than you would you would think, Richard. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, and so the, there are things. So I, I think it would, I think you would enjoy just listening to them, and I, I would encourage it for everybody. It's a great interview with these the, both of them. Um, uh, but 
they they there's some there's a nuance to this and that that uh if i recall as they were discussing this is that um often we fill in we fill in pieces of the story even though we don't have the story from our parents you know because you know you know about the holocaust so you imagine what your parents went through and you know maybe whether they were at auschwitz or wherever they were and uh, you imagine the difficulties and and you fill it in with more kind of generic historical facts and things that, that you've learned. Um, and uh, so I said, you, you, I think you would enjoy hearing what they had to say about that. I, mean, I can't remember specifically everything they talked about, but uh, I think you would find it illuminating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Steve. So, um... Rick, I, I wonder here if there's something from story that might help us with something that a lot of us are going to, I think, be trying to capture as the pandemic uh, uh, hopefully starts to wind down or change. And that's the idea of how our synagogues, or maybe FJMC has changed. You know, what, what are we not going back, right? Everybody is trying to figure this. How do we harvest or cull some of the things that have been good, you know, and sort of, so what would you offer from the perspective of story of how to, let's say Temple Emmanuel, where we are, is a very large congregation, or for some small congregations, to be able to, to capture um, experiences that people have had, that, you know, and weed out and start to move forward. Well, well, for me, I think the, the, this process of reflection is really crucial, is that creating space for reflection. So, um, you know, uh, we've all gone through to varying degrees diff a difficult year, you know, and some people have had a really difficult year losing, you know, a spouse or a parent or a child, you know, from, from the pandemic. Um, but for, for probably most of us, it's just been, it's been really inconvenient and maybe very isolating, you know, for, to a large degree. Um, and, and institutions like synagogues have, have had to go, you know, I've been, yeah, I will tell you something though. The, uh, the high holidays with my synagogue this year uh, was in some ways better than it ever was. <laughs> it was actually more intimate and engaging than, than going to services. And they worked really hard to create something on Zoom to make that work. So uh, so there, there, are, there are things learned from this that we would never have been, been we wouldn't have done it. We wouldn't have tried it, you know. Uh, it forced it, you know, in the, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So we people, we people started inventing and looking at new ways to connect. And um, so I, I, you know, capturing is one thing, but I think is it what what is the process of learning from it? So I, I think that maybe creating reflection circles. You know, let, let's say let's say the pandemic ended tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it just like they went up, oh, it's over. Um, you know. Uh, we need to process what we've just been through. Uh, you know, we could just move on, you know, and forget about it, but how do we process it and how do we begin to harvest from it uh, meaning and value? And so, you know, if I, I think if, you know, I haven't thought about this much, but I think I, what I would do is create learning circles or, or, or reflection circles in my synagogue and say, let's, Let's have it. Let's have a, a period of, of reflection, of reflection and harvesting of what we've learned, so that we don't just move on, but that we can we can take a look at this. How, how what, what can I learn about myself? What can I learn about my relations? Uh, what can I learn about Judaism and my experience of Judaism, having gone through this? So. Um, that that is the thing that I got I've gotten most out of my work with Paula Underwood and my research is that uh, you know reflection is crucial to learning and and the research would suggest that you know we we spend so much time doing you know but at some point um, uh, we're better off uh, taking time so if, if you wanted to become a brain surgeon 
you know, you go study and, but you really, if you're going to become a good brain surgeon, my next door neighbor's a brain surgeon. He's in residency here at Emory. It's like six year residency, you know, <laughs> you think, God, you really got to love it. Um, you know, but you know, doing brain surgery all day, every day, you're going to learn a lot. But uh, the research would suggest is that taking time off to reflect and to, and to even write about the experience uh, can actually expand your understanding in a way that wouldn't come just from practice and doing. So that, that may be something to consider. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank uh, Richard, Rick. Uh, it was a tremendous presentation. Very interesting, very informative. Thank you. Round of applause would be great. Okay. Yes, good. I want to great. thank all the participants today. If you would like to give a donation in Rick's honor, you can go to fjmc.org slash donate. And we would certainly appreciate that. And we will inform Richard of your donation, not, not of the amount, of course, but the fact that you made a donation. So again, I want to thank Richard and everybody for participating. I wish you all a very good evening, a wonderful Shabbat, and a wonderful Pesach. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, guys. Right. Beautiful. We'll catch up, Rick. <laughs>